Um, I'd like to start off by thanking um, everybody, uh, particularly the organisers, for this opportunity to present this work. Like many of the participants uh, yesterday, I'm very sad that I'm not able to deliver this talk in person. Having uh, visited just now for um, a summer school a couple of years ago, I was really looking forward to coming back. And I do hope in the future, when things calm down, that will be possible, as I had a wonderful time with wonderful hospitality last time I visited. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is some work that really has been a collaboration with a colleague of mine at the University of Glasgow for the last five years. And it's going to be a little different to the two other talks um, uh, this morning because we're really going to be looking at soft materials and um, particularly gel based materials that actually have quite a lot of implications in biomedical engineering, but they're very often used um, from kind of commercial products, but we're not necessarily clear on what their structure is. And as we'll find out, their structure actually really affects their behavior quite significantly. So that's what I want to focus on today is how can we understand the structure of gels and maybe use that information to design better materials that have um, higher value applications, particularly in biomedicine. So I'm going to start with some thank yous because uh, I don't want to forget to thank these people. This has really been um, a, a very long collaboration with Professor Dave Adams at the University of Glasgow. He's one of the world's leading um, uh, gel chemists and has a huge library of materials that can be studied for a huge range of different applications. And it's really been through collaborating with him that we've got to the bottom of how some of these materials behave. And that's been supported very much by uh, Emily Draper at Glasgow, Bart Dietrich, who actually um, uh, synthesized all the materials you're going to see today. Uh, students Demetra and Libby, uh, Dr. Claire Wilson, who did some of the crystallography I'll show you later, and my own just graduated PhD student, Dr. Chris Brasnett. And we've had a lot of time at various synchrotrons um, in Europe. So uh, Diamond, the B21 and I22 beamlines, and also the uh, for the neutron scattering work I'll show you, uh, SANS 2D at ISIS and also um, I-12 at the um, ILL in Grenoble. And all of this money uh, came from one of our UK funding councils, which is engineering and physical sciences. So with that out of the way, I'm gonna start by just giving you a kind of overview of, of a gel so you can get an idea of the kind of materials I'm talking about. And we can define a gel as a dilute cross-linked system, which is mostly liquid, but behaves like a solid. So really the materials I'm talking about today are 98, 99% liquid. Um, and um, what we have is effectively something that um, is gonna form a fibrous network in three dimensions, and that's gonna trap this liquid uh, inside the network. So gels are interesting in this respect because effectively we're trying to structurally understand something that's almost entirely solvent. We have this tiny fraction of this fibrous network, which is going to give it the solid like properties that we're interested in. And when we think about gels, most people think about them as being polymeric materials. And this is absolutely true. You can easily make gels from a number of polymers. And in fact, you encounter gels that are made from polymers every day. So if you've ever eaten jelly, you've eaten gelatin. This is a natural polymer. If you wear contact lenses, you're wearing a synthetic polymer gel in your eye. And so these things are ubiquitous um, in terms of where we find them in applications. But they're a lot more diverse than you might first expect. So yes, we can make them from polymers, but also we can make them from anything that forms a network. So for example, colloidal systems where colloidal particles can join together, they can form a gel. Um, they can form from proteins, either individual proteins or polymerized proteins. And they can form from small molecules as well. So any small molecule that can assemble into a fibrous structure is possibly capable of going on and forming a gel. And that's what I wanna focus on today. So they're interesting from a fundamental structural perspective, but actually understanding their behavior is really critical in a number of industries. So we find um, gel-based products in a lot of food industries, but we find them in um, personal care products and also in pharmaceutical products as well. And understanding how they behave over time, for example, what kind of uh, mechanical properties they have is really, really important. But since I've been working with Professor Adams, we've discovered that there's much more to them than just being these kind of passive soft materials. If you can tune the functionality of the molecules that, that are self-assembling to give this network, what you can actually do is tune them to do chemistry or tune them to have behaviors uh, of their own. So you can potentially put catalytic sites in. So you can actually do catalysis in a gel network. Or for example, you can make soft electronics out of them. And so there's a huge amount of different things we can do as long as we understand the network structure. And particularly relevant for, for maybe some people in this audience, in bioengineering, if you want to make, for example, a three-dimensional scaffold to grow um, stem cells and differentiate stem cells in, 
we know that the hierarchical properties, things like the mechanical properties and the structural properties of the scaffold have a huge impact on the type of differentiation process that may occur. And so if we understand this, we can potentially custom design much better gel based materials. So I'm going to stick to one particular class of materials, and that's something we call the dipeptide low molecular weight gelators. And the reason for sticking with these is that they actually give us a huge amount of parameter space to explore. So I'm showing you a picture here, a chemical structure of a very classic uh, low molecular weight gelator based on a dipeptide. And um, this molecule we refer to as 2NAPFF. And 2NAPFF has a naphthalene group here, this is the NAP part, and two phenylalanines on the end here, so this is our FF part. And what's nice about 2NAPFF is if we drop this molecule into a solution at high pH, so say pH 11, it will automatically self-assemble to give these kind of flexible fiber-like structures, but they're in solution. So we've not formed a gel, we've just made a solution of fibers. And we can look at these fibers and we can try and understand them. And that's one of the things I'm going to present. Now, what's nice about this system is when we form these flexible fibers in solution, we can lower the pH or we can throw in quite a lot of salt. And this will bring the fibers together in the network. So we've got a tiny number of fibers. We're going to bring them together in a network. And that's what's going to form our gel. Now, if we look at the structure of 2NAPFF, those of you who have any interest in sort of synthetic chemistry and making new molecules will notice that there's an awful lot you can do with this molecule. You could change the amino acids. You could functionalize the naphthalene group. And we'll talk about how we might do that later on and what some of the pros and cons of doing this are. But for now, I want to tell you two stories, one based around 2NAPFF and one based around a modified version, which use scattering in order to probe very, very um, carefully the nanoscale structure of these gels as they form, because that's what we're going to be interested in. Now, it would be uh, um, remiss of me to say that there aren't a lot of problems of working with low molecular weight gelators. And um, one of the things that we very often turn to to understand the mechanical properties of these materials is rheology. So this is going to give us the bulk mechanical properties. It's going to tell us how strong our gel is, how stiff our gel is. And for biomedical engineering purposes, for scaffolds, that's going to be really crucial. We want to know how strong is this gel going to be. But it tells us nothing about the structure. And when we think of the normal methods that we employ to look at structure of materials on the nanoscale, there's an awful lot of issues if you're working with a gel. So the first thing we might think of is either SEM or TEM. Well, our sample is 99% uh, solution. So if we have to dry the sample, what we're looking at in a dried sample is not necessarily representative of the gel in its natural state. Removing the liquid massively changes the structure. And so we can't be sure that we have the same structure at the end of the experiment that we do uh, at the start. So electron microscopy is not great. You can do cryo EM, and I'm going to show you some cryo EM on some of these systems later. Um, but there's a second problem, and that is the way we do a TEM measurement, we're looking from the top down. And if we look from the top down onto these nanoscale fibers, all we're seeing is effectively a two dimensional projection of a three dimensional material. So it tells us nothing about the cross section. And actually, we'll find out later that cross section is really important in terms of structure. So we're seeing, you know, a, a cylinder and a tape look the same on a TEM, uh, a sphere and a disc look the same on a TEM. We need a three dimensional representation of this network structure. Now we can move to AFM, which is better because we can do it in solution. And there's been quite a lot of liquid based AFM done on these. But again, it doesn't get around this idea of seeing beyond the surface. So that's why I'm going to stick to small angle X-ray and neutron scattering today. This is going to give us a much fuller picture in three dimensions. And most importantly, it's going to let us probe dynamics. So we're actually going to be able to follow processes as they occur. We're not just looking at an equilibrium structure. We're looking at changes in the structure with time. We do have some issues, however, with length of fibers, um, polydispersity and contrast, but we won't worry about those for now. So when we use neutron scattering, one of the really cool things about doing scattering with neutrons as opposed to X-rays is something called the scattering length density of the atoms that we have in our structure. Neutrons scatter from the, uh, from the nucleus of our, of our atoms in our sample. And what we find is that if we replace hydrogen with deuterium in our materials and then run the sample in a deuterated solvent, in our case, D2O, we can effectively do something called contrast matching. And what contrast matching does is it makes part of our sample invisible. This allows us to probe on a molecular level individual parts of a molecule and how it self-assembles. And that's what I'm going to talk about in this first story I want to tell you. 
So here's TUNAP FF. And here you can see TUNAP FF with different parts of the molecule highlighted in red. Where I've put highlights in red, I've deuterated this part of the molecule. So when I run the self-assembled structure of these molecules in solution in D2O using neutron scattering, these parts in red will become invisible. They'll still be present in the structure, but the neutrons will be unable to see them. What this will then do is allow me to really look in detail at what parts of the 2NAPFF molecule are self-assembling and interacting with other parts by effectively looking at what's missing from the scattering pattern. And I'm gonna ask some questions when I do this experiment. And this is really kind of a fundamental set of questions that we have in the gel field. If I start with a high pH self-assembled solution of 2NAPFF cylinders, which I know I get, what is the solution state structure of these cylinders? What do I start off with? How can I use this contrast matching to understand the molecular self-assembly of these cylinders? I'm then gonna throw in this molecule here, which is called gluconodeltalactone. What this does is it hydrolyzes really slowly and it re releases protons into solution. By doing this, it drops the pH of the system really slowly and it does it homogeneously. So we get a really, really nice homogeneous gel. So the second question I want to ask is, how does this process occur? Okay, what's happening during the gelation process? And then the final question I want to ask when I reach the gel state at the end is, what is the gel state structure of these cylinders? Is it the same cylinder that I started with? Or has there been a structural transformation in my self-assembled cylinder during gelation? And our neutron scattering and our X-ray scattering is going to help us probe this particular process. So I'm going to start off with the high pH solution structure. Now, one of the first things we always do when we're going to be deuterating anything is we want to make sure that the deuteration process itself doesn't affect the self-assembly behavior. Uh, the hydrogen deuterium bond is slightly longer than a hydrogen bond. And if your self-assembly is driven by hydrogen bonding, you want to make sure that that change in bond length doesn't give rise to a different structure. So we run everything in D2O in X-ray scattering, which is completely agnostic to deuteration. And what we found was that all of our X-ray scattering structures were the same. So this tells us that our deuteration has no impact on our self-assembly process, which is very reassuring. So here's the kind of data we get out of a small angle X-ray experiment. Um, and so these are very, very characteristic scattering patterns of something that is a flexible cylinder in solution. And if we fit these to a form factor, what we can pull out is the fact that the radius of these cylinders is around about 4.2 nanometers in each case. We were very fortunate to work with um, Johns Hopkins University with Hong Kong Kui's group who did some wonderful cryo EM with us. And he was able to pull out the fact that indeed in the cryo EM in solution, you're getting these flexible cylinders and they're about four nanometers um, in radius, which is exactly what we saw in the scattering, which is fantastic. We also um, turned to molecular dynamics simulations. So we worked with CWEP Marinx group in Groningen, which is where my PhD student now works. And we um, asked if he could simulate what would happen if we took two NAPFF in an MD simulation and let it self-assemble. And what they found was, yes, indeed, you will get a flexible cylinder, but they were able to actually probe the fact that this red ring in the MD simulation here is actually the naphthalene groups. And what they're doing is they're overlapping. So you're getting effectively a, a bilayer structure of naphthalenes. And then on the interior and the exterior of the cylinder, what you're getting is um, the amino acids. So these phenylalanine groups are pointing in and they're pointing out. So we have this kind of sandwich structure. That's going to be really important when we look at this selective deuteration in the neutron scattering. So what does that look like? So these are all the um, small angle neutron scattering patterns. You can see they're pretty similar to the X-ray scattering patterns, but they do have some subtle differences. So the first one here is just the neutron scattering pattern of 2NAPFF. And again, this comes out now, we can see it's a hollow cylinder. We get better resolution in terms of the hollow interior of the cylinder in sands than we do with sacs. And so we can see, and the, the, the radii come out to be pretty much the same. There's always a slight difference between neutron radii and X-ray radii, but they're all within error. So this is our, our, our standard TUNAP FF. Here's our naphthalenes in the middle. Here's our interior and exterior amino acids. So these are the ones on the end that are poking in and out of the tube. And then these ones here, this amino acid group here, this is the pale blue here. So the first thing we're gonna do is deuterate naphthalene. If we deuterate naphthalene, we're effectively making this red ring invisible. Now, 
we wouldn't really expect to see any change in our neutron scattering pattern in terms of the radius and the wall thickness. So we're going to be interested in what happens to this core radius and what happens to this wall thickness as we deuterate parts of the sample. We get rid of naphthalene, we're getting rid of something in the middle here. We might see a kind of multi-layer structure, we might see nothing. So this is our scattering of, um, of, of our um, deuterated naphthalenes. If we move to the next sample, however, you can see we've deuterated this, this uh, terminal phenylalanine here. And so what we're doing here is we're getting rid of this dark blue ring on the inside and the dark blue ring on the outside. So we should expect to see an increase in core radius and a decrease in wall thickness. If we deuterate this amino acid here, we're getting rid of the light blue rings in our structure. So again, like the naphthalene, we may or may not see anything. And then finally, the most kind of extreme version is to deuterate both of the amino acids. And so here we're getting rid of the light blue and the dark blue, and all of our scattering is simply coming from that red naphthalene ring. So we should see a huge difference in wall thickness and in core radius if our model is correct. So what do we see? Well, that's exactly actually what we do see. We can see that for 2NAPFF on its own, 2NAPFF with the deuterated naphthalene, and 2NAPFF with the interior amino acid deuterated, you can see that the core radius and wall thickness are all pretty much the same. So that's telling us that the deuteration is not really affecting what we see in the scattering pattern. However, if we deuterate the exterior amino acid, so this terminal amino acid here, or both amino acids, you can see immediately that the wall thickness drops. The wall thickness drops quite significantly here, and the core radius goes up commensurately uh, to take into account that we've lost those rings. And so this was telling us that our model actually is correct. And this is the first time anyone had really probed what the three-dimensional solution structure was of these materials. So the next trick is to add GDL and to watch the sample go into a gel phase. So we looked at the small angle neutron scattering data for the gel phase. And the first thing that happened was it didn't fit a flexible cylinder model, which was somewhat of a surprise to us. So all of these neutron scattering patterns look pretty similar. And these are all the different deuterated versions. And the first thing we realized was we've no longer got a, a standard flexible hollow cylinder in solution. And we were a little bit perturbed by this. So we had to go off and do quite a lot of looking at the literature and quite a lot of um, thinking about what could be happening in the sample. But we also realized that we'd um, quite cannily taken some time resolved data as well. So we'd taken during the gelation process a series of time steps as, as the gelation was occurring. So taken a scattering pattern at various time points. And by probing into the structure of these and looking at the structural changes in the scattering pattern, we were able to actually identify what our end state was and how we got there. And so the first thing we noticed was pre-gelation in our hollow cylinder, you get this nice bump in the data. And this bump in a scattering pattern um, of something that's in a cylinder state generally tells you you have a hollow core. Well, we know that we have a hollow core. We've been able to fit that data. And the first thing we noticed with our time resolved data is the first thing that happens over a series of tens of minutes is the hollow core disappears. So something's happening to make the hollow core go in the sample. The next thing we did was we looked at the transition in this kind of mid-Q region here, and we noticed that the shape of this mid-Q region, um, what we call the fractal region, changed. So we were getting a very subtle shift in the gradient. And what this is telling us is that our lovely isotropic cylinder, which is now solid, is now becoming anisotropic, it's becoming elliptical. And when we went back and fitted the data, we found that we could fit it incredibly well to a flexible elliptical cylinder model. Now, what that made us realize was, and because we'd taken pH data all the way through this and we looked at what was happening, is that the amino acids on the interior of the cylinder and on the exterior of the cylinder have different pKa's, basically because they're in different environments. So the pH drop affects the amino acids differently. So what we found was that the interior amino acids protonate first during gelation. And so they protonate first, the charge is removed. So the tube effectively, there's no repulsion inside the tube anymore, it just closes up. The second thing that happens is the exterior amino acids now become protonated and we lose the charge on the outside. And this allows lateral aggregation of the fibers to come together. And if you start to laterally aggregate fibers, they're gonna to start to effectively look more anisotropic and you're gonna end up with something that's got the same thickness as you started with, but it's gonna have a much wider um, major axis of the ellipse. So it's gonna become uh, much more eccentric as an ellipse as you go on. And that's exactly what you see when you fit the data. 
So for the first time, we've been able to show that this gelation process for these low molecular weight gelators is actually a two-step process. And it was only by using scattering that we were able to do this. But this threw up another question of, we know 2NAPFF is very well behaved as a low molecular weight gelator. We know exactly what it does. We can control it very well. But what we don't know is if we design any given low molecular weight gelator, will it gel? So there is no way at the moment of predicting whether a, a, um, a low molecular weight gelator will form a gel and more importantly, what the properties of that gel might be uh, so that we can design something specific for a particular application. So what we wanted to know, is there any way that we can use structural information to do some predictions? Um, and we work a lot with computational chemists, but we, we wondered if there was an experimental probe for this. So there's an assumption in the literature. If you go through the literature, you'd think that this actually wasn't a particularly um, difficult question to answer because everybody says if you have a low molecular weight gelatin molecule, if you crystallize it, then the structure you get in the crystal structure will tell you about the packing in the gel. Now, that didn't sound a particularly satisfying answer to me, that why would the crystal structure of something tell you about a soft condensed phase? I don't, I don't see why they would be related, but this seems to be a truism in the literature. So we thought, well, let's investigate it and let's see whether or not this is actually the case. So in order to do this, we had to turn to a slightly different low molecular weight gelator called 2 nap -AA, which I'll show you on the next slide. And the reason we picked 2 nap -AA is we have a crystal structure of it, but also we can tune the gelation of 2 nap -AA so it either goes through a gel state and stops, or it goes through a gel state and forms a crystal state. So what we can do is we can follow the evolution of the gel state with small angle scattering, and we can follow the evolution of the crystal state with wide angle scattering. So wide angle scattering is simply looking at um, molecular level organization, rather akin to powder X-ray diffraction, but instead now we're doing it in solution rather than in, in, a, powder in, in a powder pattern. So let's have a look at 2NAP-AA, and what we find with 2NAP-AA is we've got the same naphthalene group, but now we've got two alanines instead of two phenyl alanines. Just taking a slight different amino acid completely changes the way this self-assembles. So you can see here, 2NAP-AA can form a nice gel, it can form gel plus crystal, or it can form crystals on its own. And so again, we set ourselves some questions that we wanted to answer. If we start with a high pH uh, solution of cylinders of 2 nap -AA, if we lower the pH very slowly with a small amount of hydro, um, GDL, we know we form a gel. If we lower the pH quickly by throwing in quite a lot of GDL, we know we form a crystal. So what happens to the 2 nap -AA cylinders during this process at slow and fast um, pH drop. When do we see evidence of crystallization? At what point does this occur? And how does this compare, if at all, with either the powder X-ray diffraction or the crystal structure that we get out? So can we use those to predict the structure of the gel? So the first thing we did was a very slow, P uh, was a very slow pH drop. And if you do this, you only get gelation occurred. We were able to fit this to a flexible cylinder model which reaches a steady state of about four nanometers um, in, in radius over about a 200 minute period. But the interesting thing is we can also pick out the flexibility of the cylinder from the scattering data. So this is X-ray scattering data. And built into our model is a measure of the Kuhn length. So basically the flexibility of the system. And what we found was that the flexibility of the system drops massively as time goes on. So our fibers might be the same diameter, but they're getting progressively stiffer over time. Um, so what we were showing here is that as the pH is dropping, these fibers are locking up and becoming very stiff. However, if you look at the wide angle scattering, there are no peaks. There's no evidence of order in the fibers and there's no evidence of crystallization. Now we compare that with the fast pH drop. So immediately when we started to fit the fast pH drop, um, we could only fit this to a cylinder. We lost the flexibility completely, even at early time points. So you can see that this increase in persistence length, this stiffening of the fibers is really, really critical. So we started to, to we lost the, the flexibility immediately. We were able to fit this to um, a, a kind of roughly four nanometer cylinder, but after 180 minutes, our scattering disappeared completely. So our small angle scattering um, was, was effectively non-existent um, by the end of the experiment. And this is telling us that our fiber network that we've created has now disappeared. So we've lost the underlying gel phase structure because we can't see it in the uh, sacs anymore. So what happens in the wax 
if we're doing this in the sac. So we've said that we've stiffened the fibres and we've got a, uh, a loss of the gel state structure. Prior to 170 minutes, so prior to um, the gel state structure disappearing, you see nothing in the wax. So there's no evidence of ordering. The fibres might be stiffening, but they're not ordered. However, at the exact time point that we lose the sax pattern, you see the first peak in the wax. And this is in this red line here. You can see a tiny little peak just under 20 degrees. And so we've now got evidence of something crystalline appearing in our wide angle pattern. And if you analyze this peak, you find its real space value is 4.6 angstroms. And we know from previous work that 4.6 angstroms is the distance between two NAPAA molecules along the fiber backbone. So what we're seeing here is evidence of growth of a crystal along the fiber backbone. And if you carry on running the wax patterns over time, you find that more and more peaks start to grow. And when you compare this with the powder X-ray diffraction pattern that we simulated from our crystal structure, every peak you see in the wax, despite the fact that this is technically in solution now, every peak in the wax matches a reflection in the PXRD, and um, it's all the strongest reflections. And you always get, no matter how many times you do this, the growth along the 111 plane. And so we're actually seeing growth along the fiber. So to put all of that together, what does it tell us? It actually tells us, ironically, that the crystal phase and the gel phase are not the same. If the crystal phase and the gel phase were the same, we would expect to see evidence of packing in the wax pattern even before the crystal structure started to appear. We only see evidence of, of um, crystalline behavior once we've destroyed the gel network. And yes, the crystals that we get out are the same as the single crystals of the gelator, but what they're not is related actually to the gel phase. So we can do this low concentration, high concentration comparison, and we can start to talk about this process in terms of flexibility. So what we do know is that the stiffening of the fibers is really important in terms of crystallization, and it always happens preferentially along the direction of the fiber. But what it doesn't tell us is that we can use the crystal structure to predict what the gel looked like, because actually when you look at the sacs of the gel, it bears no resemblance to the crystal structure that we get. So yes, the crystals are the same, but the gel structure is actually something completely different. And by monitoring flexibility, we're able to pick up a little bit more about how to understand this. So whilst it would have been nice to have a predictive tool, what it has done is, is laid to rest maybe this idea that crystal structures are the be all and end all. And actually what you do need to do is use solution-based techniques such as X-ray and neutron scattering to better understand the structures of your gels. So where do we go from here? Well. Uh, having these, this, this library of low molecular weight gelators is really exciting for me because there are subtle differences between how they assemble. And we found that things like we can change the kinetics of the process simply by changing the geometry of the, the, the sample holder that we do it in. And we can change the, um, the kinetics and the endpoints of the experiment by changing confinement. So these things are massively susceptible to being confined. So we're exploring this in terms of related materials, and we're looking at building up lots and lots of different ways that we can affect these different uh, solution to gel and solution to gel to crystal transitions. We've shown that you can't predict gels from crystals. We need computational methods to do this. And we're looking at uh, focusing on having one gelator and lots and lots of um, different endpoints to our experiments. What we don't want to do is design lots of different molecules. What we do want to do is design one molecule that will do lots and lots of different things. And then potentially what we'd like to do is, is really work with biomedical engineers, material scientists and say, how can we design better materials and understand them so that you can use them in applications? And with that, I'm going to finish. Thank you for your time.